Thank you for joining us today. Today, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about recovery. And you think, well, why do I need recovery? Well, we all need to recover. And we all need to move to where God wants us to be. And so as we start out this new year, I believe God is going to bring about some good things to happen in your life. But before we talk about recovery, enter into worship before the Lord and open your heart to what he's going to do in you. Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No! 
Creation. 
Thank you, worship team. Today, as we talk about recovery, we're going to be looking in Genesis. And I think that is the truth that we all need a little recovery. You know, Romans three ten and 23 says this, There is no one righteous, not even one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, it's not hard to admit that we're sinners. It's one thing to know about ourselves, but it's hard to admit that our sin and our struggle has left a mess behind. And sometimes we're still dealing with it because of the things that we've done. You know, the Bible is full of men and women who lost their way. And so even as we talk about that, King David, his disastrous Adultery with Bathsheba, we see that in the word. Noah's drunkenness after he got off the ark. Elijah's breakdown in the cave of loneliness. Saul of Tarshish terrorizing Christians before he became a Christian. Peter denying the Lord. On the eve of his crucifixion? You know, the same is true in our lives. And when we lose our way, we, we hurt ourselves and we hurt others. But you know, the very first story in the Word of God is a story about recovery. You know, the world God planned for us was an amazing thing. A perfect environment. Things that a human could thrive in. The Garden of Eden was a habitat that was so lush and extravagantly fertile. And it's filled with God's abiding presence. I mean, God walked with Adam and Eve. And God, it was an amazing time to be in the presence of God. And those scholars have branded this as paradise. 
there's probably not words to describe how great it was. You know, the structure for living that benefited the creation. I mean, God set it up to benefit creation. You know, one of the first things that happened after God created man was Sabbath. And, you know, Whitworth says, for all our work and worry, a weekly Sabbath reminds us that God is the one writing the story. We need to remember there, that God made the Sabbath for a reason. There is time that we need to rest. You cannot burn the candle at both ends and keep going. God reminded us that he made the Sabbath for us. God is writing the story. And you know, a sustaining garden for food, the survival. If we look in Genesis chapter 2, and we're kind of looking through this, and I encourage you to go and read Genesis 2 this week and just think about and meditate on these things because I think they're important to do that. There was a self-sustaining environment, no work. I mean, how many of us wouldn't like to have a garden that things just, all the things that we love grow? We don't have to water them. We don't have to worry about the rain. That's the way it was. Let's look. The first human is created and given a wonderful place to live. Adam is sustained by vegetation and water. Let's look at Genesis 2, 7 through 14. The Lord God planted the garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. You know, God made it all. He did a work there. All the things that mankind needed to live well was there in the garden. God wanted people to take delight and enjoy his beautiful creation. He had provided for their needs, every one of them. But there is a purpose and a law. You know, in Genesis 2, 15 through 17, it says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and tended it and kept it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The tree of knowledge of good and evil belonged to God alone. And that means that man was not to set himself as God. He was not to be his own moral compass to determine and decide what is good and evil. That was God. God's the one who made those things. And when we say, you know, God, this is for you alone, and we understand that, that's what happened there. You know, the animal kingdom, there was no fear between God and, or for, between man and the animals. They lived in harmony with one another. And this was a place of perfect harmony. It's then and only then that God said that something was not good. I mean, everything else that God created was good. But all of a sudden he says, this is not good. So let's notice, what does he say that is not good? He noticed Adam's loneliness. So God blessed him with a wife, Eve, a woman formed of his rib. That's what we see here, companionship. You know, life is a lot easier when we're doing it with somebody else. You know, we need that companionship. Another human. There was no fear between man and animal, and they lived in harmony with one another. But even as we look at this, we can look at Matthew Henry by Wearsby. He says this, She was not made out of his head to rule over him, nor was she made of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near to his heart to be beloved. That's the reason that God made a woman to be a companion with man, that loneliness is not a good thing. 
But a fatal reality is the power of choice. And, you know, it seems like nothing could interfere with what was going on in the garden, this perfect environment, except when Adam and Eve lost their way. Through their disobedience, they revealed the lack of belief in the one who had created, created them and loved them. This is the origin of sin, as we see. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and it's the way death came to all people because of all who sinned. That's where sin happened. In fact, Guthrie says this, this opened the door to sin that day, and it came rushing in to every aspect of existence taking away their freedom and unfettered enjoyment of God himself. That day we lost a lot. See, the perfect place between that location is our recovery story. It's where we are recovered. So can we recover our way? In one sense, you can't. But there's a organization out there called AA that has 12 set steps. And we admit that we're powerless over alcohol is what they say. The same can be said of us. Where we have to admit that we're sometimes powerless over sin. And that it's become unmanageable in our life. We can't manage sin. We must bristle at that in a way but consider the times that you've lost your way in life we may say we could have done it better but we didn't in Romans 7 15 and 19 it says this for what I am doing I do not understand for what I will to do that I do not practice but what I hate that I do and then in 19, it says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Sometimes we do things that even though we don't want to do them, we do them. And we're all messed up sometimes. And that's what sin does to us. Sin takes us to, to a place we want to, don't want to go. And charges us a price we can't pay. And so even as we come to that knowledge, can we recover? I want to tell you yes. If we allow Jesus to take hold of our recovery before we can get together, he has already completed it. He's already the one doing it. In Romans 6, 3 through 5, it says this, Or do you not know that as many were baptized into Christ Jesus or baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life, that God has raised us to. When we come to him, when we open up to him, that's where transformation happens. And in verse 5, it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. God is going to bring resurrection to us if we're his. If we come to him, that's the only way we can recover. We recover your way by following Jesus. In Mark 1, 16 through 20, it says this, As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When they had gone a little farther from there, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in a boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with his hired servants and went after him. There's something about making a choice to follow after God. That's when things change. We need to hear the call of Jesus. 
wherever you are. And when we hear it, we follow him. Believing Jesus calls you to become something new. He's transforming your life as you open up to him. Know that Jesus uses your experience to draw others. God uses everything we go through to draw others to Christ. We need to understand that. We need to daily remember that Jesus requires us to follow. It's not choosing your own path. It's following him. We have a choice to do those things. We need to make the first steps. We got to do the things that are necessary. It's not always easy. See, some people think, well, I I gave my life to Christ. Everything should just fall into place. No, it doesn't. Sometimes it's hard. It's not always easy. But it is eternally worth it. It's worth walking this way with him. When you take the wrong steps, when you mess up, we need to turn around immediately. Come home immediately. There's something about if you if you if you told a lie and you come clean about it right away, you don't have to remember and keep telling lies because you've already confessed it and opened up and changed your way. The same is true with our relationship with the Lord. When we come to the knowledge that we say, Lord, I failed. I'm open to you. See, today is the first day of the rest of your life. We want recovery. We all need recovery. I need recovery. You need recovery. We all need it. If we, if we kind of look at the end of this, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is a reminder that God's plan and his love for us, even in our own misdirection of losing our way, Jesus called us to follow him. He called for change to happen in our life. C.S. Lewis says this, You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. We all need a change in our ending because of what God does. In John's final revelation and his vision, we're given a glimpse of the garden in heaven. That looks remarkably familiar. There is a river flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. You know, we have constant access to the tree of life there. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in the city. And his servants will serve him. Look at it in Revelation. God has provided a way for us to live forever with him. And he's provided a way through the Savior. If things aren't right in your life, what a great time to just come before the Lord, open up to him, and ask that he would just start the change in you. You know, as we talk about recovery over the next few weeks, I believe this is some things that will change your heart if you open up to him. Let me pray for you today. Father, we thank you that you are the one who transforms our life. Lord, we all are in need of recovery. We need things to change. And Lord, I am so thankful that you come in and you work on us every day, that you're not willing to let anyone perish, but you work on us, that we would change direction, that we would recover from the things. Lord, we recognize that we fail. And, Lord, we open up to you and say, Lord, touch our life. Restore us. Lord, forgive us for the sin that's in our life. Forgive us and thank you that you transform us every day, that you work in us and you minister to us where we need to be at. Lord, today we just thank you that we can come to you and be free from sin that no longer has a hold on us because we put it at your feet. Lord, I thank you for doing that today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to be a part here, come and join us at Evangel. We would love for you to be here. You can go to our website if you want to give. You can come join us 
here at 2360 Hardy Road in Benton, Virginia. We would love for you to be a part here. Come, let God do the work in you.